So, today we're going to be talking about nerve impulses. This is a lesson connected with Bio 31.1.7. So, first of all, we want to um, sort of compare and contrast electricity versus nerve impulses because they are not the same thing. They have some similarities, they have some differences. Okay? Um, electricity is produced when electrons are transferred from one place to another. Uh, they require an external energy source and electricity diminishes as it travels due to resistance. So the longer the wire is traveling in, um, you know, the less current you're going to have. The speed of electric current is very fast. It's around 300 kilometers per second. 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, so almost like the speed of light. Okay, so nerve impulses, they are created by the movement of ions through nerve cell membranes. Okay, so uh, it's not a transfer of electrons, you have ion movement instead. Uh, the nerve impulses use cell energy to generate the current. Okay, so no external energy source. Uh, they remain strong, as strong, at the beginning and the end of the uh, impulse. And nerve uh, impulse speed is around one kilometer a second. So you can see a lot slower than electricity. Now, how the electrical activity of nerves was discovered before 1940, electrical activity outside the nerve could be measured with electrodes. Um, but why and how was uh, the nerve carrier to current was unknown. Um, in 1902, Julius Bernstein proposed that the cell membrane was semi-permeable to certain ions, and when the ions moved in and out of the cell, the charge could be measured. So the evidence supporting this was provided by uh, the K.S. Cole and Curtis experiments with squid nerves. Squid nerves are awesome. So they uh, placed, Cole and Curtis placed tiny electrodes inside the large nerve of a squid and recorded the change in charge across the membrane um, every time the nerve was excited. When the nerve was at rest, it had a charge of uh, minus 70 millivolts, the resting potential. When the nerve became excited, the charge on the inside of the membrane became uh, plus 40 millivolts. So that's the action potential. The membrane took only a few milliseconds for the charge to return to its resting uh, charge of minus 70 millivolts, so that's the recovery. And here you can see the graph that says at rest you've got, you know, this resting potential, and then once there's a initiated an action potential, a uh, plus 40, the recovery, and then back to rest. So, um, the nerve conduction always starts with the stimulation of a neuron. A neuron is a nerve cell. So one neuron may be stimulated by another or by a receptor cell or sometimes even physical events like pressure. So once stimulated, the neuron will communicate or conduct info about the event in two ways. Uh, one way is from one end of the neuron to the other electrically via action potentials. And that's the one we're looking at today. And across the space separating one neuron from another, uh, in these spaces are called synapses, chemically via neurotransmitters, and we're not really talking about those so much today. Okay, now the nerves are going to be setting up these ion gradients across their cell membrane. So what happens is you have uh, sodium and potassium pumps that are using cellular energy, ATP, right there, to, to do this. Okay, so nerve cells, unlike all other body cells, carry a charge because of the rich supply of ions, positive and negative, inside and outside the cells. The charge is created by unequal concentrations of the charges across the membrane. So negative ions do little to create um, a charge on the membrane. Okay, but there's unequal concentration of positive charge, so you've got, um, you know, sodium, potassium, but they're not equal. Okay, so the pumps, uh, all of the neurons have the potassium-sodium pumps. Uh, 
and they will actively transport uh, potassium into the cell and sodium out of the cell uh, during repolarization. Okay, so there's one potassium in for every sodium, three sodium out. Okay. So at rest, it is estimated that you have about 150 potassium in and about um, five potassium out. Okay, whereas you have about 150 sodium out and about 15 sodium in at rest. Okay, now because of the high potassium concentrations in, there's going to be some diffusion of potassium out. Okay, and because of the high concentration of sodium out, some will diffuse into the cell. So the but the pumps are going to be dealing with that, with this passive diffusion, and keeping the, those um, concentration gradients in place until an action potential. So the resting potential. Well, positive ions move in and out of the cell by diffusion. Um, the diffusion is not equal. In a resting potential, more potassium channels are open than sodium. Therefore, more potassium moves out than sodium moves in. This higher concentration of charge outside the cell this creates this higher concentration of charge outside the cell. Okay? And this causes the cell memory to be polarized. So there's unequal distribution of positively charged ions. A charge of minus 70 millivolts stands for the difference between the positive ions in and relative to the outside cell. The recorded cell charge is always um, referred to uh, inside of the cell. Okay. Um, if inside is negative, this means the absence of positive ions. If inside is positive, this means an excess of positive ions. So here we can see we've got, you know, a whole bunch of sodium outside uh, and a whole bunch of potassium inside, and this creates this resting potential. Okay, now both the sodium and potassium channels open, but there's more potassium channels than sodium and this therefore uh, sodium potassium moves out and sodium moves in and this movement in and of itself helps maintain this resting potential. Out is greater than in as far as um, as far as positive ions go uh, so this causes the inside charge. So inside of the membrane, so remember that, inside of the membrane is considered to have the negative uh, 70 millivolt relative to the outside. Okay, so here you can see the action potential. So it's initiated, you have the 70 minus 70 millivolts um, resting potential, something stimulates the nerve and the action potential happens. Now the threshold level you can see on the chart uh, is the amount of energy required to initiate the action potential. So what happens when the action potential occurs is you have sodium channels opening, okay, and this causes a flood of sodium into the cell and the um, potassium ions to begin with, uh, you know, potassium channel rather, are closed so they don't move to begin with. But you have this flood of, of positive charge going inside of the cell during the action potential. So it goes from minus 70 to about plus 40. So upon reaching the threshold level, the potassium pumps close and the sodium channels open. And the sodium rushes in and this causes the inside of the cell to be depolarized. That means a charge reversal. So from negative 70 to positive um, 40 millivolts. Now once the inside of the cell becomes positive, then the sodium channels sh slam shut and the potassium channels open. Okay, so now the potassium diffu diffuses out of the cell. Eventually the flow of potassium out of the cell restores the original charge on the membrane. And then the potassium channels are slow to open and slow to close. Okay, this causes the voltage to take a brief dip below the resting voltage. So this dip is known as undershoot or hyperpolarization. So in the action potential, you have all of the sodium flooding in. Okay, 
and, this, and the potassium channels are closed, so it's not going out anymore. So this causes the charge to go from minus 70 to plus 40. Okay, so here again, sodium ion channels closed during resting potential, open um, for the action potential, and then closed again during the refractory and reset periods. So these, these events, as far as ion flows, you really need to know for the action potential. Okay, so once you have the threshold of excitation, sodium channels open, sodium enters the cell. Okay, then potassium channels open and potassium begins to leave the cell. And once you get to the top here, the sodium channels become refractory, so no more sodium is entering the cell. But the potassium continues to leave the cell and causing the membrane potential to return to the resting level. And then the potassium channels, channels close and uh, the potassium channels close and the sodium channels reset. Okay, and the extra potassium diffuses away and the, uh, you know, overshoot is rectified. <clears throat> but it's amazing how fast that this whole thing gets reset. Okay. So action potential propagation in the dendrites. What are we talking about here? Well, repolarization. Let's talk about that. Uh, because sodium and potassium are on the opposite sides of the membrane that they started, uh, the sodium potassium pump needs to transport sodium out and potassium in and restore the membrane to the original polarity. Now this takes around one millisecond, so it happens pretty quick. These sodium potassium pumps work fast. Okay, so they throw an AT, now this is cellular energy, ATP is used, but they throw two potassium in and three sodium out um, per cycle. So this relates to the absolute and relative refractory periods. Until a membrane has been restored to the resting potential, no further impulses can be transmitted. This period of time is called the absolute refractory period and lasts between 1 to 10 milliseconds. However, an action potential can be generated with a stimulus that is much stronger than usual after partial recovery. This is known as the relative refractory period. Okay, so the ref relative refractory period only is in effect when you have a much stronger stimulus. Okay, so if you can imagine uh, a toilet, when you pull the handle, the water floods the bowl. This event takes a couple of seconds. You cannot stop it in the middle. Once the bowl empties, the flush is complete. Now the upper tank is empty. So if you try pulling the handle at this point, nothing happens. So that's like the absolute refractory. But if you wait for the upper tank to begin refilling, um, you can flush again, but the intensity of the flush will be less. Okay? Uh, and this is going to be the relative refractory period, the time it takes to get even a partial, um, you know, impulse to happen again. So threshold levels, all are in unresponse. Uh, for a nerve impulse, action potential to occur, the stimulus must be above a minimum voltage or intensity called a threshold level. Now this is usually um, needs to be greater than for muscles uh, greater than two millivolts. Okay. Furthermore, every nerve cell has a maximum response regardless of the stimulus applied after the threshold has been reached. So this maximum response is called the all or nothing response. So neurons either fire maximally or they don't fire at all. Okay, um, now since every cell has a maximum response that does not change uh, with increased stimulus, the only thing that the intensity of stimulus will do will increase the frequency of the action potential. Okay, so like we talked about the relative, um, you know, refractory, or the, yeah, refractory period, the increased stimulus might help, help the neuron fire more frequently, but it's, it's not going to be any stronger. So, uh, for the nerve impulse to occur, the threshold stimulus must be um, released. Uh, here's an example. 
Okay, so if you grab a warm glass rod, sensory impulses are sent to the brain at a slow rate. But if you grab a hot rod, the sensory impulses are sent at a fast rate. Um, the brain interprets the frequency of the impulse, not the intensity of each individual impulse. Okay, so a greater number of impulses reaching the, the brain is equal to the greater intensity of response. Movement of action potential. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's talk about this because this is uh, relating to how this depolarization in one part of the membrane affects the adjacent part of the membrane. So the opening of the sodium shell channels cause sodium to rush into the cell, and this influx of positive charge uh, is then attracted to the adjacent negative ions inside the membrane. The positive charge carried by the sodium spreads as a wave through the cytoplasm, like ripples caused by a stone in a pond, and the flow of sodium from uh, the area of the action potential towards adjacent regions of the resting membrane causes the polarization in adjacent regions. The electrical disturbance caused by the sodium channels to open in adjoining areas of cells and the movement of the action potential continues. As the wave of depolarization moves along the nerve, the initiation point of the action potential enters a refractory period as the membrane once again becomes permeable to potassium ions. The depolarization causes the sodium channels to close and the potassium to open, and this wave of depolarization is followed by a wave of repolarization. So this is what it's saying, is that once it depolarizes here, it is going to cause this next part, okay, um, that's close by, to also depolarize. So it depolarizes here first, then here, and then here. So it's a succession depolarization at the different parts. And this is the myelinated nerve fiber, so that's why you've got these areas where there's, you know, insulation, basically. Um, and then there's this wave of, ref of uh, repolarization. So here you can see, you know, potassium going out to repolarize here and then there, and then finally it would be the next one. So the action potential is conducted uh, from the axon hillock, which is the top of the axon, and will travel its way down to the synaptic knob. The manner in which it travels depends on whether the neuron is myelinated or unmyelinated. Unmyelinated neurons undergo continuous conduction, whereas the myelinated neurons undergo salatory conduction. So that means it jumps, basically. So in this previous this is myelinated, so it jumps from this point to this point to this point. If it wasn't myelinated, it would just be continuous all the way across. Okay, so continuous conduction is like dominoes falling all the way across. Okay, this happens at unmyelinated axons. A wave of D and then repolarization travels from one patch of the membrane to the next patch. Okay, this is like dominoes. Now, Saltatory conduction, that's more where it's jumping. So it depolarizes here, jumps, depolarizes here, jumps, depolarizes here. It's actually faster this way. Okay? It's because saltare is the Latin word meaning to leap. Okay? So these myelin free regions is where the depolarization occurs. So which is faster, myelinated or unmyelinated? I already told you, myelinated. Okay, because the jumping is faster than the domino effect. All right, which would you uh, think would conduct an action potential faster, larger diameter, or smaller diameter? Okay, uh, it's going to be the larger diameter uh, because you know you could move faster if you walk through a, a hallway that was six feet wide as opposed to one foot wide. I think it's, it's got to do partly with uh, also the amount of ions that are present.
decay that can be stored in this larger axon and therefore higher concentration equals faster transmission. Okay, and that is our nerve impulses. Submit a summary. Have a good day.